Welcome to Novelist Spotlight, the podcast where published fiction writers are interviewed to gather their insights and writing lessons so that we can make ourselves better and more effective writers. In the spotlight during this episode is Jeff Matthews, a novelist who writes under the name J. Lawrence Matthews. His latest book is titled One Must Tell the Bees, Bees as in the Winged Insect. The subtitle of that book is Abraham Lincoln and the Final Education of Sherlock Holmes. But we're also going to talk to him about his recent Writer's Digest article in which he argues that it's not enough to set goals for completing your novel. We must have a system for producing the work and ultimately completing it. So in the article, and what Jeff Matthews is going to share with us today, is his own story of his own repeated attempts and failures to write his novel uh, before he stumbled upon some advice, some key advice that made all the difference and set him on a productive course. He will share that lesson with us during the program. Jeff Matthews, welcome to Novelist Spotlight. Mike, it's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. We're glad to have you. And, you know, before we start in earnest, I should alert our listeners that you can contact Jeff Matthews at the email address in the program notes. You'll also find his website U URL there so you can learn more about him as well. So Jeff, this discussion is well-timed because New Year's Day is coming and uh, writers <laughs> tend to set resolutions about finishing their book projects. I know I have, and I suspect you did some of that yourself, at least your your past self, oh, yeah. and it didn't work out so well. Uh, sometimes it worked for me, sometimes it didn't. Uh, the, the clue I get from your article is that it didn't necessarily work out well for you at the time. Tell us your story of the failures you went through and what system you eventually adopted that led to success. Sure. And just to uh, back up a little, Mike, I had written a, a book for McGraw-Hill back in 2010, a nonfiction financial book about uh, Warren Buffett visiting the Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting. I'm a finance guy. That was my background. And what I used to tell people who would ask me, what does it take to write a book? I would say, get a book contract. And I wasn't trying to be a wise guy. What I meant was when you have a contract, you've got deadlines. And there is nothing like a deadline to make you write something. I remember Isn't that the truth. Uh, yeah. I remember being, being, being a magazine editor, I get that totally. But but you're making a distinction, or let's make this distinction. You were writing nonfiction books before you wrote your novel. And those, correct me if I'm wrong, but what you do is you put a treatment together, you send it to a publishing house that first says, yes, we would like this book. Here's your deadline versus a novel, which is like, it better be done and show it to me uh, right. because I'm not going to look at just a first chapter. Right. Well, the way my the way my my first book came about, my nonfiction book, it was called Pilgrimage to Omaha. And I was a blogger for my on, on the financial side. I had a finance blog called Jeff Matthews is not making this up. And it was short. It was short humor about serious financial topics, because all my life, what I really wanted to do was be James Thurber. He was my that's kind of what I, I loved and short humor. But I applied it to financial topics as as an adjunct to my job. And out of that, I got a call from McGraw-Hill because I had done a series on going to the Berkshire Hathaway meeting one year. And they said, would you turn this into a book? That's how my book came about. But you're right. Once I had that contract with McGraw-Hill, uh, I had deadlines to hit. And I, I, I vividly remember I was sitting in a Starbucks and I was still working at the time. I had a very full-time job, but I was, I was finishing up this book for McGraw-Hill. And I remember sitting in a Starbucks, writing something and saying, I have to go to the bathroom really bad, but I can't do that until I finish this section. And that's what that's what a contract makes you do. That's what a deadline makes you do. And it, it really disciplines you. Um, but so so five years Lesson later. Lesson number one, have a strong bladder. OK, go ahead. Number, <laughs> no, number one is, is get a contract. Number two, have a strong bladder right. and finish that thought. Exactly. Go, go ahead, Jeff. And then so. Uh, at the time I'd finished that book, I thought, well, I really want to write a, a fiction book that I'd had in mind for myself. And I started it while I was also working full time. And as your introduction implied, I was struggling with that because I had a full time job. I had a lot of other things. I'm married. I have children. I have a life. And to to set time aside to write is difficult for an undisciplined person like myself. And every year I would say to myself, okay, 
next year, I'm going to finish this book. That's going to be my goal for myself. And I'm going to finish the book. Next year would come by. Nope, nothing done. Maybe a couple of pages, maybe, maybe some notes, but no real advancement. And then I would say to myself, okay, this year is the year I'm going to do it. And that happened for four or five or six years until I read a book by Scott Adams, the Dilbert guy, called How to, How to Fail at Everything and Still Succeed Big, something like that. And it's a very humorous but serious book. And it's short and it's, it's easy to read. And it absolutely hit the nail on the head for me. Uh, Adams', is, uh, Adams is key insight is and the way he the way he gained success with Dilbert was he realized you don't want to set goals for yourself that you're never going to hit because if you don't change your behavior first you're never going to make it and he said so goals are for losers forget forget establishing goals what you need is a system have a system that helps you achieve a goal and that really struck home to me. I, and I, cause I'm a guy who was every year failing to achieve these goals because I really hadn't sat down and said to myself, how would you actually achieve them? So right then I said, okay, I'm going to write every day. I'm going to write two pages. What's my system. And I looked at my life. I looked at how I worked. I, I realized I couldn't write during the business day. Uh, but I did realize that after dinner, after kind of vegging out, I had time. I did things like play the drums or I would take a walk with my wife or I would hang out. I would feed the cat. I would do stuff, you know, the kind of stuff you do when you're winding down from work. And I decided, okay, that's a time I can do it. But how do I actually get myself in the in the mentality of of focusing on it? How do I get myself out of the winding down from work and winding up for writing something? And I decided... I'll pretend it's morning. I'll take a shower and then start writing and I'll do two pages a day. And that worked. And it worked for about, in all honesty, it worked for about 10 days. Uh, once I got through the first few pages of stuff I'd done over the years, I had a lot of word files and I had notes to myself and I had uh, texts on my phone and ideas. Once I had worked through all that, the two pages a day didn't come easily. And then it was down to two paragraphs a day and then two sentences a day. And finally, it was just, just do one word a day. Just, just get a word down a day. And I did it. And, and ultimately, I found three things happen when you write every day. The first is obvious. The words accumulate. And that's, that's what you need. But secondly, you start working on the hard stuff that you avoid, or at least I avoided, when I was writing for fun on weekends or on vacations in spare time. Because when you sit down in your spare time, you don't want to tackle the hard stuff. At least I didn't. I wanted to write the fun stuff. I wanted to write the scene where Sherlock Holmes meets Abraham Lincoln for the first time in America. That's what I wanted to write about. I didn't want to write about how did he actually get to that point? What what actually got him to America? I wanted to write the cool stuff. And when you write every day, you start working on that hard stuff, the connections. And the third thing, and it was the biggest eye opener to me, and it was the most profound reason for writing every day. And that is when you write every day, even if it's just a sentence, when you have to write something, it's always in the back of your mind no matter what else you're doing. I'd be in line at the grocery store. Uh, I'd be in the shower. I'd even be asleep. I, I would come up with phrases and things. My mind would be working through things while I was asleep. And at like five in the morning, I'd wake up, sort of half wake up and text a line to myself and then go back to sleep. I solved a lot of problems that way. It's it's like an It's like an extra sort of human mini superpower that exists that you don't know, but it's there. And your mind will work on these things if you're if you're doing it every day. And the last, I should say the last two lines in the book came that way in my sleep. So that's how it worked. And uh, I I couldn't have done it if I hadn't read that book by Scott Adams. So when you um so 
Hosanna's to Scott Adams. And in, in case anybody's listening who doesn't know what Dilbert is, Dilbert is the cartoon that he did for years while he was working at Pac Bell or Pacific Bell, the phone company, and was a very successful cartoonist. And then he started writing books. And uh, so here's this great piece of advice you pick up. And when you got down to one word a day, when you just decided, look, I'm going to write a word a day, um, you, as you explained, it, it forced your mind to kind of cogitate on that every day. So it was, it was like putting the, the fact that you were going to write anything that day in an incubator and or a hothouse for it to grow. So when you sat down to write, you didn't just write one word. You had that's that's all you committed to. So you made it easy on yourself. But on the other hand, once you sat down to write, my understanding is you didn't just write one word. You ended no. up writing paragraphs or pages. There, there is one. There was one day I did write literally one word. But you're right. You, you had a great comment there, Mike. You said to make it easier on yourself. If you say to yourself, I'm going to write two pages a day, you're making it very hard on yourself. You're, you're raising the bar. You're creating an unnes unnecessary very high hurdle to hit every day. And that's why I ultimately got it down to just write one word a day, because you'll never just write one word. You'll you'll write a sentence or two or three or five or 20. Just it'll get you going. If you don't make it a high hurdle, once you sit down, the floodgates will open. But I, I got to tell you the story about that one word a day and how it ties into this issue, this idea that your mind is always working on it. If you're writing every day, I I had a very minor, incredibly minor uh, issue that I had to deal with in the book, and that was what to call the orchestra at the Dupont Gunpowder Works, where Sherlock Holmes has gone as a young man. He's a chemist. Uh, he's a young man travels from England to America to work for the Dupont Gunpowder Works in Wilmington, Delaware in the last year of the Civil War. This is how he gets to the attention of Edwin Stanton, Lincoln's war secretary, gets to meet Abraham Lincoln, and ultimately gets involved in the manhunt for John Wilkes Booth. That's the real story of One Must Tell the Bees. But, but when he arrives first at the DuPont Gunpowder Works, I knew they had an orchestra because every industrial enterprise back then had or had an orchestra or a house band. Music was live back then. There were no recordings or, or records or Spotify. And Holmes plays a violin. Uh, and uh, he's going to be invited to join the house band at DuPont. What's it called? And the DuPont mills were called the Eleutherian mills after the original founder of, of DuPont, E.I. DuPont. And I couldn't figure out what to call it. And it was a really stupid minor thing that didn't matter in the grand scheme of things. It's one word out of 179,000 words in that book, but I couldn't figure it out. And it's important because every every touch, everything you you put in adds to the reality of America in 1864. So I needed the right word. And one day my wife and I were at a function and we were talking to a friend of hers from uh, old school days and he mentioned for some reason, he said he'd been in the house band at uh, at his high school, and I said, and I and immediately my mind clicked because you're, it's always in the back of your mind. I said, well, what was it called? And he said it was called the Trumbull Players, and I thought, ah, that's it. It's the Eleutherian Players. That's the name of the band. And that night, I went home and I wrote. That was my one word. I wrote. I wrote players in to this blank space that I'd had for a couple of weeks. Try to a keyword, a yeah, very keyword for you. It was it was one of those obstacles that you were able or one of those hurdles you cleared at the moment. Exactly. And so again, uh, your mind is always thinking if it's every day, if you don't make the hurdle too high, you will you will find yourself unblocking these these obstacles that get in the way of of writing a, a fiction book. So we glean from everyday life uh, the things that we need for our book when our mind is is focused on. And what you're talking about, really, Jeff, is is not just a conscious mind, but also the subconscious mind. Uh, I've had situations where I'm listening to some TV dialogue and I just hear a phrase or a word 
uh, or see a situation of vignette. And it's like, that's what I was looking for. That's what I need. So we can glean from everyday life. Uh, but yeah, I want to back up a minute. I, I'm not done with the subconscious mind because I want to talk to you about sleep and actually programming our dreams mm -hmm. uh, so that we come away with solutions to some of these, these uh, uh, hurdles that we need to clear. I, I think it was brilliant that you came home from work and you showered uh, and started uh, the day over. Basically, it's like morning. And the re reason I say that is I'm a guy who tries to write in the morning. And uh, because if I don't write in the morning, I just figure my day gets away from me. And yeah. if I do it before anything else can happen, before anything can go wrong or or uh, well, I'll leave it at that, anything could go wrong, right. then I've got it done. But the problem is I'm not really a morning writer, not first thing in the morning. And, and I work full time, so it's to work for me. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the whole idea of hitting kind of that reset button where you shower and even after a full day of work, a, a shower can be invigorating because after a full day of work, a lot of times we're tired. We don't feel particularly creative. But if we have that mindset, you know, I'm showering, starting the day over, uh, the, the laptop is sitting there uh, simmering, waiting for me to lay my fingers on the keys. It really makes a, a, a difference, I'm sure. It's a great strategy. Um, I was going to also, like I said, talk about that, the subconscious mind a little bit. You have things that come to you in your sleep, and I've heard this technique that's used by some people, and, and it's actually worked for me, although I, I don't think it was necessarily conscious when I did it. A lot of times people go to bed at night, and of course, they're thinking about a problem, something that's actually keeping them awake or something that's bothering them. And they wake up in the morning and they have an idea. They have a solution right. or an idea of how to, to tackle it. Right. And when it comes to something like writing, where we're constantly trying to produce new content and uh, create characters and situations and uh, pacing and so on, our sleep can be a tremendous ally. Our dreams, our, our, our sleep state can be a tremendous ally. It's huge. You don't, I, I don't know how it works. I don't try to program it in any way. I, I do when I'm writing, when I was writing One Must Tell the Bees, I did listen to Sherlock Holmes stories on audio books on my iPhone as I went to sleep. I, I wanted, and that was more a function of keeping the voice in my head because writing with writing Sherlock Holmes is not my voice. It's Arthur Conan Doyle's voice. And I wanted it to make it very accurate to Conan Doyle. I wanted it to read like a Sherlock Holmes book, although it's a, it's historical fiction and Lincoln is a very important character in the book and what comes after his assassination. But I wanted to keep that voice in my head. So I would keep my iPhone nearby and fall asleep listening to a Sherlock Holmes story. And I think that helped with those rhythms. Mm -hmm. And somehow the blend of having something in the back of my mind that I needed to figure out. I, I, I didn't, I never went to bed and said, I got tonight, I got to figure out the end, the last lines of the book that never happened. But I did have this issue where I, I knew I needed to, to end the book. I knew I needed a line. I knew kind of what I needed the tone to be, and I just didn't know what the words would be. And somehow over the course of a couple of weeks, those things kind of meshed and were worked on in my, in my mind, and I woke up and had them. The analogy I'd make, Mike, is my wife is a, a crossword puzzle enthusiast, and she will often say, when you work on you work on it in the morning and you, you can't get it and you can't get a word and you can't get a word. And then when she comes back to it in the afternoon, her brain all of a sudden says, this is the word it's right there. And it, and, it, and so your mind has been working on it while you're not thinking about it. So that's a very, I think, important tool. In all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I have started novels where, I didn't really know the ending, but I I knew the story. I didn't know the ending, and I'd be working on it. And in the course of working on it, certainly by the halfway point, but usually earlier than that, it would dawn on me, the ending would, would dawn on me, and I would tell my wife that I've got it. I got the ending. And that's so critical because if I don't have the ending, 
I don't have anything to write to. Right. And um, it just gives me a lot more comfort that I'm on the right track if I know where how it's going to conclude and is something I actually believe in. And my point being that uh, that daily, and it is important to write daily, uh, that daily uh, focus, that daily incubation in the in our minds uh, allows things to start to sprout. We we do find uh, um, you know solutions to these issues or the story. It is not even necessarily an obstacle. It's just that the story develops. It germinates just like anything that you water. I remember an artist who I met, and he said he was talking to my my uh, now ex-wife, but he was saying, asking her, what do you do? And she was talking, she was talking about uh, sculpting and painting and uh, jewelry design. He says, you're going to go nuts. He said, you got to focus on one thing. (laughs) So when you focus on that one thing, it expands, but you can't be jumping all over the place. He ended up becoming a very famous artist actually. And uh, that lesson, I never forgot that lesson. I think my ex-wife forgot the lesson, but I never did. Um, and there really is something to that, that when you really focus on something and, and we can take that down to the microcosm level when we're working on, for instance, you're taking, you're working on a scene, let's say Jeff, and you know, that if you are really, and that's how we write books is, you know, it's, it's piece by piece. If you're working on a particular scene or a particular chapter, uh, you are focused on that and it expands, it grows. And, and most of the time, you know, we start these chapters and they're kind of a mess and then, but there's this whole refinement and expansion process that goes on along the way. So, um, hey, so I want to just say that you're not really saying goal setting is not a good idea to set a goal. But what you're saying is a goal without a system is useless. It's it's going to fail. Correct. Correct. Now, S- Scott Adams says goals are goals are for fools. I think that's his quote. And he doesn't. What he what he really means is that a goal without a system to get it is a fool's errand. I think that's the real message there. You've got to have a system. Whatever you do, whether you're, and everyone does different stuff, right? Everyone has a different, is in a different place. You're an airline pilot. You're a nurse. You're a doctor. You're a waiter. You're a writer. You're an artist. You're, you bust tables you pump gas, everybody's got a different way of life and, and different obstacles. And you've got to look at yourself and look at how your day goes and figure out how can I accomplish this? Well, you know, in fact, getting back to this New Year's and the resolutions, because I'm sure there's a lot of writers out there setting their resolutions. Uh, let's let's take an example of that. The number one, if you Google it, the number one goal the, my, uh, for a resolution for New Year's is lose weight. Right. The problem is that people say, I want to lose weight this next year. They don't say how many pounds. They don't say, and then they don't calculate it out and think, well, how much is that per month so that I can measure myself along the way. They don't say, how am I going to change my eating habits? Exactly. Uh, how am I go- going to, to eat? less or how am I going to eat better? So it's a goal without a destination, a specific destination and no strategy for getting there. And Scott, you know that, that saying that um, if you have no destination, any, any road will get you there. <laughs> and Scott Adams uses the weight thing. I, I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but it, one of his examples is if you, if you say, I want to lose 10 pounds by Christmas, that's your goal. You're, and that's all you do. That you just say, "I'm going to lose ten pounds by Christmas." You might change your eating habits for a day or two, but ultimately you won't, and you won't lose the ten pounds, and you'll hate yourself because you haven't done it by the time Christmas comes around. But if, but if, if instead of saying my goal is to lose ten pounds, you say my system is I'm going to give up alcohol and bread. And I'm going to walk a mile a day. And that's all you do. That's that's your system. And you do that. And you adhere to it for the next 90 days or 180 days or however long to Christmas. You're going to lose the 10 pounds. Yeah, and I'll tell you what. The, the little example you just gave there is a very good one because I know people who have quit drinking and that alone would drop weight off them. Or people who keep weight off, they have an exercise regimen. They exactly. they do go out and walk every day exactly. or some form of exercise that burns calories. And, and there are people who actually respect the laws of physics, which is 
it all comes down to how many calories are coming in and how many calories are you actually burning. So never mind though, all these different diets, it's a, it's a lifestyle change. It just like writing, you know, there's, there's, you know, kind of, kind of the diet thing for writing too, where you, you come up with, with crazy formulations, but in the final analysis, it's got to be pen to paper or fingers to keyboard and you got to be producing. So as an example, your strategy where a word a day, but um, it expanded to to much more than that. Right. So let's talk about your novel, the the mm-hmm. one that you were able to actually publish because um, uh, your system did work. One must tell the bees right. is the title of it. And one of the reasons I'm interested in it is the blending of historical figures with fictional figures sounds a lot to me like one of the very famous writers of our era, E.L. Doctorow, who uh, they referred to as the New York Times referred to him as a literary time traveler and uh, talked about, I love this phrase where they said he consistently upended expectations with a cocktail of fiction and fact. Mm. Mm. Um, Was he an inspiration to you at all or did did it just so happen? I can't believe you mentioned him because that ragtime was the book that Uh really changed, you know, altered my mind. The, yeah. way, the way he did that was something else. And it's still, it's still. Talk about that experience when you read Ragtime. For people, I've been meaning to read it and I have not read that book yet. So why don't you talk, tell us a little bit about the book and what kind of aha moment you had at that time? It is set at the turn of the century, the 1900s, when there was a lot going on. It involves historical figures such as Emma Goldman, the revolutionary, uh, J.P. Morgan, Henry Ford, explorers who were going to the North Pole. But it's it's set at a house in a a New York suburb, I think Rye, New York, someplace like that. And it's it's this very uptight family, and they get involved in these different people. The 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 daughter and the son get involved. I think the son becomes a revolutionary. It, it falls in love with Emma Goldman. The daughter get, gets involved with other causes. And a, a character comes into their life, Cole House Walker Jr., who wants to marry or falls in love, I think, with a maid. And it, it I can't describe it, Mike. It's too, there's too many uh, pieces of fabric in the cloth. It's it's fascinating the way he weaved it all together. And he created these wonderful characters that illuminated what was happening at the time in many different facets of life, economics, politics, women's liberation, the whole bit. And I was just blown away by it. And it's a celebrated novel. I mean, if, if if for our listeners, if you have not heard of Ragtime and Al Doctro, it is a celebrated novel. It was it, it it's well known, well referred to, uh, read by many. Like I say, it's one that's on my list that I haven't gotten to yet. Mm-hmm. So um, obviously, an influence for you. Mm-hmm. And uh, so when you decided to write, um, one must tell the bees. Talk about talk about that novel now. What is what is that novel? Was, uh, give it, us give us the skinny on that one. Sure, it was two stories to begin with. The first was Death of Sherlock Holmes. That was the book title that popped into my head right after I finished my book from McGraw Hill, and I thought, oh, that would be fun to write. I've always thought it would be fun to write a Sherlock Holmes book that was in the classic vein of Arthur of Arthur Conan Doyle, that had the real voice and was a good mystery and. I that stemmed from going to Barnes and Noble and going to that Sherlock Holmes section they used to have, and there would be the the Sherlock Holmes books by Arthur Conan Doyle. But then there were also would also be a few books by other writers that they call them pastiches now, um, and and I would always pick. They'd always have great premises. I'd pick one up. It would have a great premise. But the voice, when you started reading it, the voice would always be a little off. It would be not quite the Arthur Conan Doyle voice and the emphasis on placing it in Victoria times would cause, I think, an overabundance of of old words, 
on a, a overlaying a, a with, with the overlay of a of a kind of a modern voice. And I just thought it would be fun to try to write one that was really good and much like one of the originals. And that was kind of what was in my mind. And I began working on that. And it was a fairly straightforward kind of mystery. And I didn't get very far because I didn't have my system in place. And a couple of years after I started that, a second book idea popped into my head called Sherlock Holmes Meets Abraham Lincoln. And I thought that would be a great idea. I wonder if that could have happened. I'm a Civil War guy and a Sherlock Holmes guy, and I was able to figure out that it would have happened when Holmes was very young. It would have happened in America because Abraham Lincoln never went to England. It would have happened during Abraham Lincoln's last year of his life, meaning during the peak of the Civil War, probably would have involved gunpowder, chemicals, DuPont. Holmes was a chemist. So, gee, let's try to get Holmes to America as a very young man in 1864. And I thought I had two books at the time, but ultimately they they came together. Both stories interweaved. Uh, the book starts in 1918 when, when Holmes is in the last year of his life and he and Watson are bound for their last adventure together and goes back in time to 1864 when Watson discovers this document Holmes has written about this previously unknown period of his early life, the, essentially an origin story of Sherlock Holmes uh, meeting Abraham Lincoln and becoming involved in the manhunt for John Wilkes Booth. And that was the idea. And as I got into it, being a Civil War student, I wanted to make a few points about that period. I thought there were lessons from that war and that time that we'd kind of forgotten. And as I worked on it, uh, the tone of the book came as I was talking to people. I I I made a point of telling anybody who asked about the book what I was doing. I didn't want to pretend I wasn't writing something. I wanted the pressure of my friends knowing I was working on this book. So I would tell them if they asked, I would say, I'm writing a book. What is it about? Sherlock Holmes meets Abraham Lincoln. And about six years ago, as I was right in the thick of it, I said that to a friend at dinner and he said, um, oh, so Sherlock Holmes was, so did he actually live in America at some point? Because I thought he only lived in England. And and I didn't know he was in actual, he had, did he, when did he come to America? What year? And he, what I realized was this guy actually believed Holmes was a real person back in the day. Hmm. And that shocked me because that had never crossed my mind. But it also it really excited me because I realized I can make Sherlock Holmes a real guy. I'm going to put, I'm going to make this history and I'm going to tell it as history. And the tone that night, the tone of the book came, became this happened. It, it went from being, I, this is a story I think you'll enjoy to the tone was this happened. And I worked very hard to make it accurate to the history of the times. And that was a, a big discipline in writing the book. And very important, too, because one of the themes of the book that, de- that developed as I wrote it was the importance of understanding our history before we try to rewrite it. And that kind of came out of this whole uh, front page uh, uh, development of uh, people tearing down statues and boards of education, renaming buildings and taking Lincoln's name off of buildings because they didn't quite understand exactly what Lincoln had done. And I thought it was important to make that point that we really need to understand our history before we, we try to rewrite it. So I wanted to make a few points about that era. And that's and, and to do it through Sherlock Holmes's voice, which is a very rational, thoughtful, uh, logical voice, mm-hmm. not, a, not a taking one side or the other, not being shrill in either way, uh, would, would be a great vehicle. And so that's, that's what it ended up doing. So it sounds like when that fella said to you, thought that Sherlock Holmes was a historical figure, a real I mean, he is a historical figure, but a fictional figure, when he thought he was a real figure, and you realized uh, that that that's probably the case 
maybe, you know, maybe with a, a lot of people. Uh, it sounded like you started writing with more authority. Absolutely. It totally changed everything. It, 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 I remember the feeling of, I've got the tone. I, I know I've got the tone now. And, and, and subsequently, Mike, I, I learned that, in fact, most people, a majority of people on the planet do believe he was a real person. Mm. And that's okay. And I, and I understand it because he's such a well-defined character, right? He's, he's, he's so crisply done by Arthur mm. Conan Doyle, and he's been embellished upon by all these other uh, people in different media. And that's fine. And, and I thought, how wonderful. It's, it's the power of storytelling. Absolutely. And I mean, you know, nowadays people say, you know, uh, you know, uh, nice shot, Sherlock, or, or uh, <laughs> yeah, you, you figure that one out, Sherlock. Right. I mean, he, he is present in our everyday lives, really. Uh, he, his name pops up all the time yep. and people understand him. They know about the overcoat and the hat and the pipe and um, just, just uh, that whole image that was created of him, uh, of that thoughtfulness, really makes him a great narrator for the book. Now, does he actually narrate it, or is he just the focal point? He, he narrates the American story, the meeting Abraham Lincoln story. It's told. It, it, it's told. What happens is, 1918, Watson is retired, living in London, gets a note from Holmes that says, "Doctor, I've relapsed." And by this time, Holmes is retired to the South Downs to tend his bees. And he, this note comes to Watson in London saying, I've relapsed. I've, I'm horribly addicted to cocaine again. Please bring your medical kit and come at once. And Watson does so. He hops on the next train to Eastbourne. And while he's in the train, he takes out a manuscript that the note was attached to that Holmes had sent and discovers that the manuscript is a long-promised treatise on the art and science of rational deduction that Holmes had been promising to write. And he decides to start reading it on the train, and he discovers it begins with this previously untold story of this journey to America as a young man. And so that's how the American story unfolds. Watson begins reading this, and it becomes Sherlock's voice He's telling the story to Watson in this in this manuscript. You know, I think it's another brilliant thing that, that you did is you listened to you were trying to get the voice or maybe the cadence, maybe the the uh, persona. All and of you that. listened. All of that, yeah. There you go. And you listened to what? I mean, you were on YouTube listening. Um, no, I mean, there's no, no such thing. No. So, Mike, what I listened to were books. I've become quite a connoisseur of of Sherlock Holmes books on audio tape, on audio, uh, you know, audio, uh, audible uh, books. And there are a wide variety. There are many different narrators, actors who have done this. And the Ben Kingsley does a great job. The fellow who played Watson and I'm blanking on his name right now, but he was he did a fabulous job playing Watson on the series with Jeremy Brett on the on the series ITV, I think, back in the 90s. Uh, he narrates uh, many of the stories. And so a lot of different actors have narrated them over over the years. And I've kind of picked out the ones that I really love. And he, I those are those are what I listen to on my phone. Oh, there you go. But I will just add for our listeners that, for instance, if you were to write something where Alan Watts, the the famous Zen priest, uh, American Zen priest, uh, is going to be a central character, you're going to do what Jeff did, but but with a uh, kind of a, a spiritual book, a spiritual character, Alan Watts, a true life figure. There's uh, bunches of, of uh, lectures by Alan Watts with that very distinctive voice of his and that very distinctive pacing that uh, that is, uh, uh, I won't say unique to him because because I'm sure it's not unique to him, but it's it's certainly his. Uh, it's a hallmark uh, of, of his. So um, so it's a tool. It's a wonderful. I mean, YouTube is a wonderful tool when we can reach back and actually hear characters in the real voice. Of course, that's not always the case uh, with everybody. I don't think there's any audio recordings of Ben Franklin, but I could be wrong. <laughs> so. Um, 
you also not not to begin with, Jeff, you took you made it really difficult to yourself, actually. What you were talking about writing, what you did write, it sounds like it was intricate. It wasn't as easy as simply writing a novel with a lot of fictional characters. You had to really sell this thing. You were taking two historical figures and uh, putting them together. I mean, do you think that that this was a, a harder assignment than it would have been if you were just deciding to just write your your garden variety novel with all fictional characters? Well, I can tell you that the answer is absolutely yes. It would it was much more difficult because I'm writing the follow up, which is going to be a much shorter book, not nearly as difficult. Does not involve two stories in two different time periods going back and forth, and yeah. It was, and is it actually a sequel? Is it a sequel to the first one? It is. It's in, a, and I don't want to pretend. I, I don't want to come across like the only thing I want to write about is Sherlock Holmes. But I've always thought there's a three year period when what when Arthur Conan Doyle killed off Sherlock Holmes, and he because he got tired of writing these stories, and so. He pretended Holmes was dead. He pretended he killed him at, at the Reichenbach Falls. He actually did try to kill him at the Reichenbach Falls. And then the demand was so great to bring Holmes back to the reading public that Arthur Conan Doyle resurrected him. And, and the story is he didn't really fall into the Reichenbach Falls and et cetera, et cetera. And that he was only – he was only – hiding for three years. He was, he was kind of on the run for three years, trying to draw his enemies out into the, into the open by, by making them think he was dead. And all we know of that period, that three year period from the, the Holmes stories is Holmes told, tells Watson that he was, he traveled in Tibet, visited the head Lama, the Dalai Lama, mm -hmm. and then went to Mecca and then Khartoum, and then back to to France, and finally England. And I've always thought, and that's all we know. And I've always thought that was a really cool journey. That's a very spiritual journey, right? Mm -hmm. the head, who wouldn't want to know what Holmes and the head Dalai and the Dalai Lama talked about? And who wouldn't want to know what it was like to be in Mecca in 1894, or whenever that mm -hmm. was? So, mm -hmm. so that's the story. But in my mind. This is going to, it, the, what I wrote was sort of my own equivalent of Gravity's Rainbow. It was not that it's compared to Gravity's Rainbow, not that it's anything like Gravity's Rainbow, but it was a very long, complex process. And what I'm thinking of, this, this follow up is going to be like The Crying of Lot 49, which was a very short book. And that was the one we all read instead of instead of Gravity's Rainbow. So, so <laughs> I'm trying to make it easier for myself and the readers. And the, the, yeah. sh the short answer is definitely yes. It was much more difficult to do that book. So but I, I will say there's nothing wrong with taking a guy like Sherlock Holmes and just saying, you know, he's my character and I'm going to write another one and another one and another one because he is time tested. He's battle tested. People love the character and they're in, you bring Sherlock Holmes to modern day there's a bunch of new crimes today, financial crimes, cyber crimes, you name it, that, that Sherlock Holmes, not, not that you would bring him necessarily into, into the modern day or the future, but um, because you, you sound like you're a, you've got a passion for history, Jeff, so uh, you may want to keep him in his time period. But uh, I don't see anything wrong with that. I mean, you stop and think about all the successful writers that... Um, uh, it worked with the singular character. I mean, you take uh, John D. McDonald and Travis McGee made an entire career out of Travis McGee and so many writers today who are less famous and less talented than John D. McDonald uh, who, who did that. Um, well, thank you, Mike. That's good advice. And I appreciate that. I like hearing that. Well, let's get back to your system for a minute because mm -hmm. you talked about your system. Mm -hmm. What is your system today? Is it when you are you doing the evening shower and then it's the one word, you know, the commitment to one word, or has your system changed in terms of time of day and commitment? It changed because my lifestyle changed. I retired. I retired from my very full time job uh, several years ago, and I was able to begin writing full time during the day. 
So now what I do is I write first thing in the morning. I write, I take a break. I'm not, I don't know how writers can write for four or five or six or seven hours at a stretch. I don't either. Really? I, yeah. I. Yeah, it's I, such an exacting, uh, you know, to begin with it. Part of it is also it's just sedentary, and I one of the things I I I do is I don't stay sedentary. I mean I will be for X amount of time, but I'll get up and I'll pace. I'll talk into a recorder. I'll take a drive with my recorder. But to go for that many hours, I'm I can see a grand total of six or seven hours with an hour on, an hour off, or two hours on, an hour off, that sort of thing. But when people sit for yeah, I'm with you. Uh, you know, five or seven hours. Yeah, that uh, that's more than I could handle. And I like to write in public. I like to write at coffee shops mm. because Me too. because it forces you to actually write. I mean, if I if I'm at home, I can waste a lot of time. Uh, now that I don't have that intense structure of gee, I've got, I've got a full-time job and I've only got a half hour to write at night, so I better do it. Now that I've got lots of time, I, I like to, what I like to do is get out in the morning. I ride my bike to a coffee shop, so I get that physical exercise you talked about. I break for lunch. Uh, I write after lunch, and then I'll usually write late afternoon or maybe evening. So I, but I, I don't go any more usually than say two hours at a stretch. Mm -hmm. Well, and you have the luxury now that you didn't have before. And most people don't have that luxury. So that strategy you talked about is critical to have a system where you can figure out where you're going to um, fit it in the day and what kind of commitment you're going to have. And uh, just, just a, a lot of, um, a lot of great advice there, Jeff. And don't make and and don't the key is as you you pointed out don't make it hard on yourself because mm -hmm. if you feel like that you've got this pressure to do two pages a day or and you you know all writers as you know Mike usually talk about well I try to do two thousand words a day or I try to do five hundred words a day or I try I just find that very it 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 makes me freeze up. Mm -hmm. And if I just tell myself, get a word down, I'm going to get a lot more than one word down, but I'll get something down because I won't freeze up. So our guest has been Jeff Matthews. And the article we've been talking about with the system that um, he uh, laid out in this discussion, but does it in, in, in detail, appeared in Writer's Digest. And the headline on that, if you want to go ahead and search that out, is go ahead and write that book but what's your system? And of course, uh, the author of One Must Tell the Bees, and that's available everywhere books are sold. Nowadays, you can get these books everywhere. So uh, you know what to do to get your hands on Jeff's book. Again, Jeff Matthews, our guest. Jeff, thanks a million for taking the time. The article is really interesting. I think you gave people some really valuable advice here. Like I say, especially people who don't have the luxury of full-time writing, uh, which is, you know, 90 plus percent of uh, the writing world, I would say. Thanks for your time. You're welcome. And and, and, the, and readers can find the, the article as well as background on the book on my website, jlawrencematthews.com. My email address is there. Reach out to me. I love to hear from readers. And I really enjoyed this talk, Mike. It's been wonderful. So did I. And listeners, uh, again, it's in the program notes, email address and website. You can learn more about Jeff and uh, get, get we'll find your way to that article and uh, get into more detail than we did. So until next time, Mike Consul signing off for Novelist Spotlight. <laughs>